Start recording. So, um, this week we'll be going over chapter two, um, and that's and that's about variables, and um, so that's going to be about variables, and basically uh, just kind of R and operations, but primarily variables. Right? It says variable statements and expressions. Um, Week three, we will be covering uh, debugging and, and Python modules. They're two very short chapters that don't introduce too much there. It'll give us more of an opportunity to work with what we're going to be introduced today, which is turtles. And then around pi uh, week five, around weeks, uh, in week four, we start tackling for loops. Um, I'd say basically the that the big, this is the first, what we have is right now with variables, the first tiny hurdles that you might hit. But for loops are the first really big hurdle for a lot of students. They're formally introduced in chapter seven. Um, and we're gonna introduce uh, them over time, uh, well, act they get introduced our first time over here in chapter five and we're gonna so gradually introduce them. But for loops are the big, first big hurdle, basically because it involves having to repeat stuff again and again. Um, so today what we're going to do is that I'm going to first start off by asking uh, um, with regards to the readings. Does anybody have any questions about the readings, um, like to chapter two readings? Like did anybody, if, if you read it over the weekend, does anybody have any questions about it? I'm sure that there's plenty of people who did not end up doing the reading and I understand. Um, please, you know, get that done when you get the chance. Uh, the readings. According to the assignment list, let's see, the chapter two readings oh, aren't even due until, until uh, Wednesday, so great. The exercises are due on the 27th, shouldn't be too bad, so I might as well give you the initial introduction over here. The idea, this is, so this is about variables, values, and uh, operators. Um, so as we've been working, so you've had some, exp and Hopefully you've been able to go to the first lab and get to the point where you're able to boot up a window and start interacting with uh, Python. Okay. Now our now with Python you've got uh, the ability to you've got again as I mentioned like the most powerful calculator in front of, in front of you and it's very useful at being able to do these kind of calculation things. You've got the ability to um, you know not just do the normal operations that we have four plus five is equal to nine great. Um, but also be able to create variables. X is equal to seven. Okay, and then we can say, uh, we can say, what is X plus um, eight? So seven plus eight is equal to 15, great. So I don't have to, now, because I'm operating in this repo where I'm asking Python one line at a time, I don't have to write the print statement. It's just going to read, evaluate what I put in, and automatically print it. Um, to evaluate something, so and that, that, that second word, evaluate, does bear mentioning as to what that is. Um, the way statements are arranged in Python is that they're statements. They, they, you, you do something with them. Um, let me go ahead and actually write a proper script over here. So let's go ahead and get that up. We have something along the lines of, let's see, let's go ahead and put this on the desktop so I can upload it later. Um, variable lecture. Okay. So over here we have things like print the, the number 17. Set x equal to, uh, set uh, word equal to hello. And don't bother trying to scramble to print, you know, copy this down. That's not what I want you to do over here because I'm, I'll do inconvenient things like move up a line and, uh, and put something in between lines, which is very annoying if you're doing it on paper, I know. Um, so uh, print a string. And there we go. And then I can just save it and run it. And it will and it will do the th the things that I set it, set it out to do. First thing it does is it prints seventeen. Second thing it does is prints the words. This is a string, and then it says words equal to hello. It doesn't print out word over here because I never told it to print out the word, right? Uh, this is actually a very common mistake that I make to this day. 
and you'll make it forever. You're like, aha, okay, I've set these variables up and I run it and I'm not getting out any output, aha, because I forgot to tell it to print what I needed. So that, that's super common. The more you, and the more you make that mistake, the more you're like, oh, right, yeah, you'll, you'll figure it out like as soon as you hit the run button. So no worries there, but we've got 17 and this is a string. So 17 and this is a string are what we call literals. Literals are the things that you would see in equations when you're doing like math where, where the, the kind of defined parts of an equation. So if you're, again, if you're working in like, again, let's just like switch to like a math class for just the smallest bit of a second. Um, I'll pull up a whiteboard even, right? You know, if I put this in and I say, okay, we've got, yes, thank you. We've got, um, you know, something like f of x is equal to x plus 7. 7 in this case would be a literal in Python. It's kind of defined here. There's not, it's not a variable. It's not any part of the, it's not a function. It's just 7, right? That's what, what we refer to a literal, okay? Uh, similarly, um, this um, string over here, the this is a string sentence, that is a literal. Basically, a literal is any kind of value that's not in a variable. Okay, making sense so far? We've got, so that's kind of our division. We have things that are inside variables and things that are outside of variables. So what kind of things can we store? Well, obviously you can store strings. We'll get into more detail about what that is in a second, but let's go to more familiar things, which are numbers. As I mentioned last time, we've got two types of numbers. We've got ourselves, and I'll go ahead and grab this one, and let's just drag, let's just make you smaller so I can get you centered on the screen. We've got ourselves uh, two types of variables. We've got, oh, sorry, two types of numbers. We've got ourselves integers. So integers are things like this, just big, friendly numbers, right? And it does mean the same thing as, as it would in mathematics. Uh, po any number that's positive or negative, that's not a floating point number, right? That's an integer, that's an integer. We can, and we can do all the operations with integers that we'd expect. We can add them, we can say, subtract them, we can multiply them, and you can divide them. Divide by two, and that gets us 2.5. Now those of you getting from a, coming from another uh, programming language, you might be like, what? That, uh, but, but that was a trick question on all the exams I had to take. Five divided by two should give me two. Um, so, um, and if you're, this is your first program language, you get to ignore this bit. Um, Python works by the way of least surprise, and the least surprising way is the way that calculators do it, which is that if you have one integer divided by another integer, you get a floating point number out. You get, you know, calculators tell you that two divided by five is gonna be two and a half. Sometimes though, you want to keep the, you, uh, now, now, now this is for everybody. Sometimes though, you want to keep the, you, you, if your inputs are integers, sometimes you just want an integer as output. We have a second operation, five divide, divide two. And this brings us back to uh, what I'll call fourth grade arithmetic, which is actually important that we stay in fourth grade here for a bit. Five divide, divide two gives us the quotient, right? Remember when you're doing, uh, if we're, do, if we're doing, you know, arithmetic, like long division by hand, remember how, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm giving you all fl flashbacks at the moment, and you're doing, right, five, divide by two, minus, so we, we multiply by that two, minus four, we've got one remainder, and then you'd write something like this, two remainder one, right? And this would be, and that would be the quotient, and now you know why I type everything out the quotient, and then this number over here would be the remainder, right? Everybody remember having to do that at some point in their life, right? So if, so if you just care about that quotient, that's what we use divide, divide for. In other words, we get the integer portion of this. And another way to think of that is divide, divide just simply gives you this portion all to the left of that decimal point. Ends up being the same thing. Um, so again, 10 divided by Three will give you 3.33, although it gives you a five over here. Weird, we'll get into that in a minute. Don't worry about that for right now, but it gives you what you'd expect for the most part. 
Um, if you do 10 divided by 3, you just simply get 3. Um, 12 divided by 3 gets you not 4, but 4.0. But if you say 4, who's going to care? It's, everybody understands what you mean there. But the computer will give you back a floating point number. right? Again, if you use the division operation, operator, it's going to give you back a floating point number. Which, if you haven't figured it out by now, that's the other type of number we have, floating point numbers. Okay. Um, we've got integers and we've got floating point numbers. Um, and because of the way, you know, and does that prevent us from, do we have to be careful about how we, how we interact with these things? Heck no. 2.5 plus 5. That's a floating point number. And that's a number over here. You add them together, you get a floating point number works exactly like you'd expect, the least surprising way, right? It's not going to give you an error. It's just going to, internally what happens is that you get 2.5, that's a floating point number, and then we have an integer over here, and it goes, oh, well, you can't add an integer to a floating point, but you can turn any integer into a floating point number just by adding 0 0.0 to it, so we're done. Um, and so now we just add two floating point numbers together. That's what happens when we're uh, with that. So again, don't really worry about that too much. Um, and, and we can do the same, th and all the same operations over here that we would expect. 7.5 divided by minus 2.5 gives us 5.0. Uh, 3.5 times uh, 4 gives us 14, right? Gives us 3.5 times 4 is the same as 7 times 2, which gives us 14.0. And again, it gives us kind of all that annoying math that we don't want to do, um, you know, that, 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 you know, the, the parts that you left the, that, that the calculators are for, not, not this. Um, I wonder, though, I always forget about this because I teach multiple languages. 16.0 divide, uh, divide, divide, uh, 2.5. Does that work? It does. That's very weird. Okay, whatever. Ignore that. I never, I, I believe that. If, if you didn't hear me monologue right there, I have no, you know, that comes up so often that I'm not even going to bother about it. Or so little, I'm not even going to bother about it. Apparently, you can do that. So, um, what other operate? Now, uh, those of you who are, um, and going back to fourth grade and, and all the algebra stuff you had to deal with, you probably had to deal with order of operations as well, right? You, pro you probably remember PEMDAS or BEMDAS or whatever, whatever acronym you learned from uh, from uh, from your you know primary school, um, the acronym differs based on which country you're in, um, because sometimes parentheses are referred to as brackets. Um, so all those annoying kind of math questions, like oh, 95 percent of people can't get this uh, get this math question right, and it's an ambiguously written math thing. What you say to those is you really just kind of plug it into a computer. And if you can't plug it into a computer in an unambiguous manner, then it's a poorly written question. Um, four times seven. So over here, we might have something like uh, four plus two times, uh, let's go with five to make the math easy. So we have, and yeah, it doesn't matter how many spaces I put in between these things. Okay, the white space doesn't matter. So four plus two times five. This is going to work off the same rules that you would use for order of operations, which is that multiplication, you know, parentheses, exponentiation, multiplication, division, they're on the same level, and addition on subtraction on the same level. So the multiplications and divisions, if there were any, would go first. So 2 times 5 goes first, then we add that to 4, right? It's the same kind of way you would do that. Um, however, you're rarely trying to solve these. The only time you will be trying to solve these are in the first exam, where I'll give you a few and ask you what the answer is. Um, the only time where you're, uh, you're going to be writing them for the most part. And if you're always like, wait, which one should go first? Or is it going to be ambiguous for me to, hard, and hard for me to read later? It's always advisable to add parentheses so nobody has to do, wait, what, do, what goes first in their head? Always, add, always, always be sure to use parentheses. Parentheses are a tool. Use them. And, it, and yes, it's the same thing, but this is certainly easier to me read, and it's also more clear. Your intent is more clear in case the code has to be modified later. Okay? So um, there is one operator, though, that we do have. 
Um, and, and that involves us again, there's a reason I brought up fourth grade math, right? We had five divided by two, which gave us uh, 2.5. We had five divided divide by two, which gives that. And then we have five uh, percentage sign two, which gives us one. So this is the modulo operator. Um, and there's all this kind of, uh, uh, a kind of amazingly uh, elegant mathematics that goes behind it and how it's similar to operating on a, on a closed space like a clock. Um, and stuff like that. Um, typically in mathematics, it might be ri written something like this, like five plus uh, seven in, in mod, in let's say mod four is equivalent to, that's congruent to, so that would be congruent to, ah, zero mod four. And that's nothing that you have to worry about because that's mathematics and you get to uh, ignore that until you get into I think 3223 for that kind of uh, stuff. Um, there's all, so there's, but it's based off this like a very elegant mathematics stuff. All you have to remember is the practical. Divide, divide gives you the, sorry, divide, divide. No, it's divide, divide. Gives you the quotient. The percentage sign is called the, is, we call, refer to as mod. And that gives you the remainder. This actually gets pretty useful later on. You're, but so over here, right, you use division to get the actual answer. But you can also use five with two division signs to get the quotient. And then you can also use five mod two to get, you know, you can use this modulo sign to get the remainder. So for instance, we can do, um, you know, if we have this number, 27 divided by, let's go with six, right, 4.5. You can use 27, divide, divide, 6, right? And the quotient here is 4. 6 times 4 gives us 24. And then the remainder would be 3 because we have three, le there's, a three dif there's a difference of 3 between 27 and 24. Um, other modulos are fairly straight. Now, why do we use this? There's some kind of niche cases in computers that we would only really deal with when we're programming, such as trying to figure out what the heck is the last digit of something. And we can use mathematics to do that, uh, or specifically this mathematics operator. For instance, if, say, I've got some number, like this one, and I just want the last digit of it, the ones place, right? I could go and convert it into a string, I haven't talked about strings in detail yet, but I could convert it into a string and get the last character off that string. Or I can modulo by 10. Moduloing by 10, right, if I were to divide this number by 10 using fourth grade arithmetic, this number divided by 10 would be 12 remainder 3, right? Divide by any number by 10, you can kind of just think of it as chopping off the, um, if we're just, you know, don't care about the decimal place, you just kind of chop off the last number. If we're in the mode where we do care about that, we, it's just simply moving that decimal point over from here to here. Um, and then the modulo just simply says, hey, so we had, if the quotient was 12, and the remainder was three, this gives us the remainder. So it's very quick at getting that. The other thing we do use with this is to kind of check if numbers are divisible, which we'll get to later. But this is just kind of our, um, our operator over here. This is just kind of an operator that we have. So, um, so yeah, we have parentheses. We have exponentiation. We have a parentheses. We have exponentiation, I'll fill, um, which I haven't gone over. I went over last time, but I'll need to go over it again. So we have multiplication and division, which kind of we have star, we have divide, divide, divide. And then we have the modulo, that's technically division, right? Because you have to do the division operation to get the remainder. And then we have addition and subtraction. So I've got some good news and bad news. Um, there's other operators, that's the bad news. There's uh, this, and then there's, uh, and then there's the ampersand, which is always a pain to kind of draw anyway. And, um, there's, um, and there's the bar symbol. That's the bad news. The good news is that nobody uses those unless they're dealing with computer hardware level stuff or weird binary operations. 
um, like logical binary operations, so we get to completely ignore them for the entire semester. Um, just, and, but that brings us up. Now those exist, and the reason I bring them up is because the standard thing you might want to do is like if I want to figure out what five squared is or some number squared, you might type this. Five, because this is how you write it and basically everywhere else. This is where the least surprising thing is actually going to fail us. And that gives you seven, which is uh, very confusing. Two, you know, five times five is not seven. Um, and that's because it's not doing five times five. It's doing um, the Zor operator where it's lined up five in, in binary and, and two in binary. And it asked to Zor them, which would give you one, 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 which is seven. And you'd be expected to know that how on your third day? I, I don't know. So, um, but the point being is that that operator, ex it, it already kind of exists kind of under computer science that we, we already had a use for that. So we don't do that. To do exponentiation instead, as I mentioned last time, you use two stars. Use two stars. So star star for exponentiation. Now, ignoring all that stuff at the bottom, you can look up the order of operation, the pres or, you know, the precedence anywhere you like. Uh, but at the bottom over here, at the there, there's some other stuff, right, that go on here, like uh, Boolean expressions that we learn later that work exactly as you'd expect them to. But at the very bottom, is this is the assignment operator, right? The, what we what we think of as the equal sign is the assignment operator. The assignment operator always goes last, which is useful. We use the assignment operator to take some values and store it in a variable. Like I've said, x. So we have some value x. Then we have the assignment operator, and we can have like something. Or we can have something like we had earlier, five times four plus two. That would give us twenty-two, right? We have something like this. It makes sense that this gets evaluated first, and then we would do the assignment operator, that, that this value would get stored, right? We always, when we think about the equal sign in math, it's always the left side of the equal sign and the right side of the equal sign, right? So it's, it's two sides of that. And so you always kind of solve one. So over here, we're going to solve this expression and sort it in there. And we refer to this, by the way, like when you, uh, this, this, these kind of mathematical things as expressions. And you evaluate these expressions to get what value it is. Oh, I am why did I get an error there? Because I had it highlighted and I pressed enter, which deleted everything and replaced it with an enter. So um, x is equal to 2 plus 5 times 4, I believe I had. And then there you go, 22. Okay. So um, these numbers, again, work pretty much exactly how you would expect them to. 1.0 is equal to 2.0, um, gives you 3.0. And like I said, these things work exactly as you'd expect them to. 0.1 plus 0.2 is equal to 0.3000000000004, just like you learned in math class. Um, this comes, so doubles for the most part are, um, uh, so integers, again, their own thing. Um, other programming languages have their own kind of definition of integers, like the integers and longs and stuff like that. Don't worry about it. Just integers here, whole, you know, nice whole numbers. Doubles are compatible with pretty much everything in every other language, used, which uses a, the IEEE double precision floating point format. Um, and it stores numbers in this format, which hopefully you will eventually learn, which is that it has a, a single bit dedicated to the sign, exponents, fractions. You don't even know what bits are yet formally because I haven't taught that yet. But simply put, it's got this format. And what we have to do is that we have to take numbers in base 10 and convert it into a binary system. These computers only understand things in ones and zeros. Okay, we use a base 10 format because that's really convenient to use for us. 
And I'm pretty sure the reason we settled on 10 any other, more than any other number is that most of us have 10 of these. So um, there you go. That's my hypothesis there. Um, but computers, they deal with uh, zeros and ones. They deal with bits, binary digits. That's what bits are. In other words, there's only two, rather than the values being zero to nine, they only have zero and one as their values. So you have, so this thing is 64 zero and ones long. And we got to take our number from our binary number, convert it into here, into base, in, from base 10 to base two, and back again. And as you can see, it's got a weird kind of notation for that. And that notation is great when we want to do things, uh, you know, like store very big, arbitrarily large numbers in scientific notation. But occasionally, it introduces some weird amount of error in it, just tiny amount of error. Generally, below what, if you've learned in chemistry, like your significant digits, or your significant figures, rather. So it happens occasionally. It's not really something to worry about, but it's the kind of this, but it's the end result of the same kind of thing as like when we do one divided by three, right? And you get this, you get repeating threes. We're just, even though, and, and, and you know, technically it goes on forever, but the computer can't really handle that. And that's kind of what's going on over here. You've got a format converting and it ends up being just kind of a mess in the conversion process. And sometimes you end up with artifacts like that. Overall, though, it happens fairly rarely, and I had to come up with a very contrived and very scripted uh, kind of thing to do that, to pull that off. I had to use that specific example there, because uh, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.2 is going to just work just fine. Uh, 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 is going to work just fine. It's very rare that you get those kind of situations. Um, anyway, but those are, but for the most part, numbers work exactly the way you'd want, and you can store them in variables, which is great. Um, you can store more than one thing in a variable, um, or sorry, you can you can store more than just numbers and variables. Variables only hold one thing. Variables only hold one thing. Here, though, we can store more than just numbers. We can store string. String, and now other programming languages, they have characters and strings. You don't have to worry about that. This just has strings. A string of text, that's what we refer to as sequences te of text. Or as it might more formally be called, glyphs. Symbols that we give um, kind, some kind of representation to. Uh, so over here, we've got the string. Um, so let's go with hello over here. Word is equal to hello that stored these five glyphs together and I can print it out. And I can go back over here to our, our script over here. Word is equal to hello. Print hello. I'll start working from here now. Print word. So I say to print out the variable. Run it. That's great. Hello, this is a string. Sorry, you're 17. This is a string. Hello. Um, our strings can have any kind of symbols we want. Okay, sentence over here. Run this. Boom. And uh, furthermore, let's see. Do I have a, another language stored on here or no? I don't have another language uh, stored on he, on here. So let's just go ahead and change the language. Um, Japanese. Yeah, there we go. Copy paste quickly. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put this and put that text in here and print it. And there you go. It prints out any kind of glyph we can put in a string. Doesn't matter uh, if it's English or Japanese or Mandarin or um, or Arabic. It's gonna be in there. Um, this is. A pretty big deal because, you know, 20 years ago, this used to be a struggle to deal with. But uh, any kind of text, you, if you want to use it, you can use it in Python, which is pretty nice. Um, so um, there's a couple of exceptions that we go on about this is that, like, uh, you know, 
notice that we begin and end with quotation marks. Or you can use single quotes or double quotes. It doesn't really matter. Um, and the reason we use both is because we might get into this uh, situation. I said hello to the class. So I have, so I begin the quote with a single quotation mark, end with a single quotation mark, run it. I said hello to the class. But if I flip that around and do double quotes over here, I kind of get myself into an issue because I said, because the computer says, oh, begin string, I said end string. And then, what the heck's a hello? I don't know what a hello is. I have no idea what the hello variable is. It's in, there's no operators here. And it's going to run it, and it's going to say, ah, oh, that's invalid syntax. Can't even run it. So that gets around that issue, being able to do that. But other programming languages also have that issue too, and they don't allow you to do, have the same flexibility. So what we could use here is also something called, and you'll see in other languages too, is called escape characters. The backslash symbol, which is the one right above the enter key on an English keyboard, or an American keyboard, I should say, I said, and the backslash tells it, OK, computer, there is a special character coming up. I don't want you to uh, interpret it literally. I want you to pay attention and combine it with the backslash character. And it says, OK, so slash quotation means I want a quotation symbol. Um, this is other uses, such as uh, slash n over here, which is I want a new line symbol. In other words, the symbol to break between lines because you can imagine just kind of a mess. You can see this that by breaking up into lines, the Python interpreter kind of gets it into a mess. Um, now, before I completely drone on about, about everything and completely lose the chance to go into turtles and stuff, um, I do want to say that, you know, there are fun... Um, let's go ahead and turn Word back into this. So there's two more things I really need to cover. So, hello. So just like you can do operations on, um, on numbers, you can do operations on strings. And again, the principle of least surprise uh, applies here. Word two. So word plus number. Hello, word plus two. It's going to crash. It's going to say you can't add a number, you know, this string and a number together. It's just not going to work, right? There's not really a, there's no unambiguous way to interpret that. You know, not really a sensible way. But on the other hand, if I add two words together, two strings together, it's fair, there's a fairly unambiguous way to interpret that, which is that we want to combine them. Word one plus word two is equal to hello world, all one word, right? It just simply says if I've got, so you can, we refer to plus being used in this matter as concatenation, which is just a fancy way of saying we're going to glue these strings together. We're going to glue it together, no worries. Um, there is no way to subtract. That what in the world would you want to? How would subtraction even work if one is longer than the other? Uh, I don't know. Are there negative words? I, I I mean, I mean, my English teacher says there's negative. There you can be negative, but I don't think that matter. That's what they meant in this context. Um, nor can you multiply strings together like this. You can't, and you can't divide. There's only adding one string to another, gluing it together. One thing I do like about Python, though, is that you can multiply a word by a number. And again, it's going to give you the least surprising thing possible. So word time five, word is hello. Multiply that by five, you get five hellos. Least surprising thing. Okay. Um, this comes up rarely, but when you do use it, it's super useful to be able to do that. Um, just simply being able to multiply that together. All right. Um, the last thing I need to teach you is probably the most important thing, um, which is, and we're going to go back to working with integers for a second. So to do, do, let's go move this back over here so it's centered. So I'm going to create a variable over here. Um, let's go ahead and edit, restart the shell. So clearing it out, 
doesn't remember anything now. So like there is no x defined right now. So I'm going to give x a, a definition. x is equal to 5. Okay? No problem there. All right? y is equal to 5. Right? x, 5, y is equal to 5. And if I change x to 6, it's 5. Sorry, x is 6, y is 5. I can change variables. I can update. Remember, the assignment statement says take what's on the left, sorry, take what's on the right and store it in the left. Okay, that's what this equal sign does. Take a 5, store it in, in there. Take a 5, store it in y. Got x and y over here, no problem. This one says take a 6 and store it in x. Storing something makes sense that storing something in x isn't going to change what's stored in y. Remember? Okay. So 5. And the way that, and again, and the way these work, if I were to do x plus y, the way this works is that with variables is that it evaluates them. It says, aha, there's a variable. What is that value in the variable? It's 6? OK, I'm going to replace x with 6. What's stored in y? Oh, it's a 5? OK, I'm going to replace y with 5. So it's 6 plus 5 gives us 11. OK? x is equal to 5. y is equal to x. Take what's on the right, 5, store it in the left. Five, x is now, x's value is now 5. x is equal to, take what's in the, and over here, same de, uh, deal. x is equal to, is equal to uh, 5. So we, so we take the, a 5 over here, replace the x with 5, and store it in y. So y is now equal to 5. x is equal to 6 now. X plus y. This is 11, not 10, or not 12. Changing at store, this is not, this is not going to be 12, right? 5 is equal to, at, we took a 5, this is the assignment operator, not the equality operator. We take a 5, we store it in x. We take the 5, we store it in y. We take a 6, we store it in x. That isn't going to change what's stored in y. This does not create a strong binding like it does in mathematics. It's not the equality operator. This is the assignment operator. We are taking what's on the right and storing in the left. Make sense to everybody? And, and that should give you a heavy sense of relief because, my god, what if we had to keep track of every variable in our head like that and which was defined in terms of other variables? That would be a mess. So the assignment operator says, let's take what's on the right Store it's on the left. And that also allows us to do weird statements like this, but weird but very useful, as we'll see. x is equal to x plus 1. This is a nonsense statement in, other, in mathematics. In computer science, it's perfectly fine. In programming, it's perfectly fine. Here, we take what's on the, on the we evaluate the right side. So 6 plus 1 gives us 7, and we store it on the left. So x's value is now equal to 7. If we do this again, we say, OK, we first look at the right side, 7 plus 1. That gives us 8. So we've got 8 over here. We've evaluated the 8. We store, we take 8 and we store it in whatever variable we put over here, which just happens to be x. Make sense? So do the left side first. And you, so you do the right side, and then you store it in the left side. Right side sto gets stored in the left. Again, better way to think about this rather than the equality statement is to think, is to think I'm going to be storing, in the, you know, storing this like that. But that would be rather annoying to have to write every time. So there you go. So. Um, there are other types of variables, Booleans, which are true-false value. We cover them um, when we talk about conditionals and stuff like that. But for right now, you're going to be working with numbers and strings and what we're going to be working on today. So um, 
what I would like you to do now is open up your textbook, your Runestone textbook, and scroll all the way down to uh, project number two. You can also find it by clicking on uh, our, our page, going to modules, module two overview, and it's the link under, and it says link under Tuesday. Make sense? So go over here, click it, and that will give us driving the turtle. Variables can hold all types of objects. And objects are basically like complex, you know, complex values. So sometimes they're numbers and sometimes they're letters, but they can be also other things. In this case, it's a thing we call turtle. Now there's going to be two lines of magic that you're like, why in the world are we doing this? Well, pretty much one line of magic because they're going to explain one pretty easily. And then the rest is just like, oh, these are the commands. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a minute again to either go to click over here, go to the modules, go to the module two, go to modules, module two overview, and then go over here at the bottom where it says attend and click on the Tuesday. Otherwise, if you're already on RuneStone, you know, go to the, and you're already on the text, you know, you log into RuneStone. The other way to get there is you would go to uh, the textbook, scroll all the way down to chapter two, or to project two, under the appendices, and it would get you to, draw, to driving the turtle. Okay, we are gonna be going over to this in more detail in chapter five. The reason we enjoy turtles is that it gives us the ability to interact with, um, with objects in a way that allows us to actually see what we're doing. So when we go over for loops, we'll actually be able to see for loops in a way we can visualize them. Um, and again, this kind of gets the chance to show off what the textbook can do. Go ahead and just, once you're there, hit save and run and we can see it in action. You'll see a box come up on the screen, the graphics. Um, and that's the output of our turtle program. Turtles, so what is turtles? Turtles is a paradigm that was, as a programming paradigm, programming pedagogical tool that was developed in the 60s for the program for, called, for a programming language called Logos. Um, and it's been kind of implemented in a bunch of other programming languages because it's very effective at what it does. It's a very simple graphics tool. And what we're doing in Turtles is that we're looking at a bird's eye view of a giant canvas of white paper over here. Okay, just bird's eye view of this right over here. And the turtle has a little uh, you know, paintbrush or pencil or pen attached to his tail. And as he walks, he drags his tail along the ground. To, and that's how he draws stuff. Um, so, let's go ahead, so let's go ahead and look at how this works. So first of off, we have import turtle. This just simply says to the program, hey, turtle's gonna be a thing in this program, in this programming language, sorry, in this uh, programming exercise we're doing. So, you know, get all, that, get all that ready. Line two is just empty, that's fine. It's very common to separate out, separate out the import statement with all the other rest of the program. Line three. This is the magic statement. My turtle is equal to turtle.turtle. .turtle. This over here creates the new turtle object. This says to Python, hi, I'd like it, uh, give me a new turtle. That's what it is. Why is it like this? Turtle dot uppercase turtle, you know. I know why, it's because that's the way you write constructors, um, which means again, nothing over here. But ignore that. Just simply accept this is the only line of magic we need to know. It's a fairly easy line of magic to remember. We've got the equal sign and we're storing this in a variable called my turtle. We can call that variable whatever we want. Just consider it as like the name tag that we're putting on the turtle. That's how we're gonna refer to him. A lot of times you'll see me, and, and pretty much every time after this, you'll be seeing me uh, store the, the turtle in a variable called Bob because it's three letters long very easy to say. So, but right now it's my turtle. So we store it in my turtle. Line four goes my turtle.color green. 
and it says it sets the turtle green. Now, these things, if you haven't noticed them, they're in a completely different color. They've got a hashtag symbol as, as, it's, as, the, as the most modern meaning of it is, but also the pound sign, the number symbol. That's a comment. That basically says this is for humans to read. It's not code, so the computer just ignores it. It's a great way to help explain the code. So my turtle, that color green. Uh, five, move the tur uh, line, so this sets it green. My turtle dot forward 50. This moves the turtle forward 50 pixels. Um, again, the pixels are those tiny little squares here. Um, so 50 pixels is going to move forward. And since it moves forward, it drags the paintbrush. And it ends up stopping right around he here. Right? That's where 50 is. It moves forward 50. The next command is turtle dot up. It tells it to lift up the tail. Well, it's, the turtle was dragging the paintbrush along by the tail. So turtle.up says lift the tail. And then the next line, <coughs> my turtle.forward50 moves him forward another 50 steps. So notice that we have a empty space. Sorry, we have this green streak, and then we have a blank streak just as long, right? Because he lift, we told him to lift his tail. Line 8 turtle.right, change the direction 9 to the right, left works too, it does. Um, right and left are used to turn the turtle to the right and to the left. Make sense? And uh, you can probably take a guess as to what the unit over here for 90 is. It's degrees, right? So a uh, 90 degree turn is going to, um, it, it, to the right, so basically it gets the turtle facing down. Then turtle dot, my turtle dot down tells it to put the tail down, and my turtle dot backward, 100, draws a green line 100 units long. Okay, this is, you know, again fairly standard for um, for these kind of directions, and it gives you an idea of what you can do with the turtle. Um, we control it by saying, hey, move forward and backwards, move fo the turtle forward, move the turtle backwards, and you can turn it right, and you can turn it left. You can change the code over here, Tur my turtle dot left. There. Now, the way this works to make a turtle do a command is that turtles are objects. Your integers are objects too, so are your, um, so are your strings. Everything's an object. And objects are essentially as you'll learn in 1068, kind of actors. They have two things, they have values, and they have the things they can do. And to access either of those things, you do a dot. So my turtle dot to do something that's built into the turtle. Color changes the color. Forward makes it move forward. Okay. Um, there's nothing stopping me from changing the color to red. Um, and the nice thing about turtles, and I'm going to stop recording for a second. Yeah, turtles are fairly limited in what we can do in terms of graphics uh, with them. On the other hand, um, what they're good at is these kind of are mathematical figures. Oh, send them both. There we go. So manage. Trust this. It's very annoying to have to do that. So trust, oh, come on, really? You're really going to make me have to do this? Hold on a second. Uh, VS Code is being dumb. Workspace trust, add folder. Sorry about this. I've just, I just I want to hide the code from you un annoyingly because I've used it on on the final exam in previous years. Um, and I very much like being able to reuse things that are similar. Here we go. You can do things with turtles to make you know these nice kind of spirograph kind of figures with them. That's what these turtles are really good at. Being able to make these kind of very pretty 
very mathematically complex figures. Um, which, if you watch it drawing, all it's doing is drawing hexagons. That's really all it's doing. It's just drawing overlapping hexagons um, that are radiating out, radiating out from the center. So, um, and it's very, it, it works. Oh, there, it's finally like registering all the times I hit it. So, um, and that's where we would eventually be able to get uh, to with turtles. Um, but we can do things, and, and the more you learn how to code, the more you find that we can do with the turtles. So part of what I want you to try out today is experiment a bit with these turtles. Um, so we've got import turtle, and then the second line that you'll need to work with turtles over here is you'll need a variable. You know, you have to make a new turtle to work with it. I like to call my turtle Bob. Bob is equal to turtle dot turtle. Open parentheses, close parentheses. That's, again, the only kind of magic line you're going to need. And then we can tell him to move. Bob dot um, forward to, again, tell him to move. Um, or you could be lazy like me and you can just simply do FD, which is just an abbreviation for forward. But again, forward. Forward. Um, and again, right to turn it right um, however many degrees. So we can do right 45, Bob dot forward 90. and move like that, no problem whatsoever. Um, right and left allow you to do that. Up and down allow you to, to trigger whether or not you're drawing with your turtle. And um, let's see. There's also one more statement that might be useful. Uh, Bob dot go to, and then an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And go to, and, this, and the reason I do this is because I, I, I like being able to kind of show you how this is working. Bob dot go to 100. So it moves a bit, then we tell it to go to 100, and then we tell it to go to 0, 0. Um, this is a coordinate plane. This is what I was referring to. You don't need to really know much more else than the coordinate plane. Uh, Bob starts at 0, 0 in the coordinate plane, right? And it's just, just not got the axes. So if I told it to go to negative 100, 100, it would go negative 100 in the x direction and positive 100 in the y. So, and that's it. And that's basically what it comes down to. It's a just a core. It's just kind of a coordinate plane. Go to allows you to move, and as you noticed, it didn't turn him at all while he was moving. He just kind of glided to that position automatically. Let's see, what's another fun thing that that's useful to know about? So we've got. Up, down, so, so we've got up and down to control whether or not you're drawing. You've got left and right. You've got forward, backwards. And then, let's so, so Bob dot up, right? We can say Bob dot forward 50. And, you know, he's not going to draw anything, but he'll move. Bob dot draw 50. But there is something fun, but there is one other thing we can do. Bob dot stamp. And this is best, um, the best way I find to kind of show this is to just copy paste this a few times. Bob dot forward and then stamp, forward 50, then stamp, forward 50, then stamp. So stamping, basically, uh, imagine that he gets a bunch of ink on his belly and he does a little belly flop and leaves a big impression on the page. That's a stamp. So uh, what I want you to do now is take maybe 10 minutes to go and have fun and figure out stuff about turtles. Play with it. Um, the turtle graphics um, have, if you Google Python turtles, your first link should be turtle graphics in the Python documentation. And it goes over all the things you can do with turtles. Um, you know, this is their example of what it can do. Um, 
you can try try out some of their code and see things like that. Um, it does it in a slightly different way, but using graphics as a script. And you can see, uh, I mean, you can kind of just see like all the, the, there's other things you can do. Like you can change uh, the outline of things versus the, um, versus the, the, the line you're drawing. You can change the shape of the turtle that you're drawing, which to be a triangle, a square, a circle, or a turtle. Like that's a, so for instance, we can go over here and we could say uh, bob.shape is equal to a turtle, which I do a lot, by the way. And now you'll see that we actually have a turtle going across the screen as opposed to an abstract triangle. So you get the ability to move, move around with this. So go ahead and take 10 minutes to kind of mess around with this. If you're having trouble getting and get running, um, then uh, let me know. There is one thing you must not, absolutely not do though. Um, absolutely under no circumstances. Do you want to boot up idle, hit new script, hit, you know, start writing a turtle script over here. So import turtle and then say like, Bob is equal to turtle.turtle, .turtle, right? So this will work so far. The, the critical error is when you, do hit, when you do this and you hit save as and you go, oh, what should I name it? Well, it's a turtle program. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to name it turtle. Don't do that. That's going to break Python or break, um, that'll break uh, your ability to use turtle programs until you delete it. Because when you do this import turtle, first thing it's going to do is look in the folder it's in and say, hey, is there a file named turtle here? Oh, no. I'll go and check the Python library. In this case, though, it's going to say, oh, there is a turtle program. It's me. I'm going to import myself. So just, you know, give your things descriptive names. Uh, I said, no, I don't want to save it. Okay. So again, here you go. And again, use the above, you know, you can use the, uh, the code, either of the code blocks is kind of an example there. So a couple, again, a couple quick things before I let people go if they want. Uh, first things first, um, so turtles, should you care about this for, the, for exam one? Always the first question about, uh, that's most pressing on a student's mind. Yes, a lot of questions, one of the nice effective ways I have of testing students on, their, uh, on, uh, on exam one is giving you some code and saying, ask, and asking you either to draw something, or which of the fit, or given this code, which of the images does this draw? And in case you're worried about having to bring a protractor and a compass to your exam, no, I'm gonna I keep it limited basically to 45 degree and 90 degree turns. So nothing too scary with regards to that. Um, but it gives me a very good way to kind of visually test for loops. You know, otherwise uh, you kind of have to manually work through it and can be very kind of abstract and not gratifying because you really don't see anything. Um, turtles are not great for, you know, doing games and stuff like that, but what we'll eventually do with these things is that we will build a full-blown hurricane kind of tracker, which allows, given the, you know, the data on a hurricane allows us to plot it on a map. This is actually a fairly flexible kind of uh, framework we have here. Um, we now... You don't have to worry about like memorizing it for um, this upcoming lab. Turtles will be the focus of lab three, um, where you'll do things like draw um, an image of the Olympic rings. You'll be drawing your initials using turtles, that kind of stuff. So, plenty, so you'll get plenty of practice with this in lab three. That's where I expect you to actually know this. You're not going to need to know this for lab two. Okay. Um, but otherwise, again, turtles are just kind of a lot of fun and we'll be using them. Um, so if you have any trouble that you want me to resolve, that you want me to resolve, um, please stay behind. Uh, if you need to speak to me, please stay behind. Otherwise, adios. We'll see you later.